All right, let's go ahead and get started. Let's calm on down. And get ready. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, we, we thank you for just being who you are. We thank you for loving us the way you do. And thank you for this group of believers as we come out here to enter into the second part of our study, the book of Revelation. And what a powerful book it is, Lord. And and Lord, there's so much to it. Lord, there's so much to grasp. There's so much to try to comprehend. And, and we don't even pretend to think that we could ever do that on our own. So we invite your Holy Spirit to open up our hearts, get us where we need to be, help us to discern what it is that the Holy Spirit is saying to us tonight. Help us, Lord, to understand how it might apply to our lives when we leave here. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, first of all, I just want to apologize for what happened last week. The pipes busted in there for the water, water heater and the nursery busted and uh, there's cords and everything strung out here in the, uh, in the fellowship hall as they were cleaning. And, you know, shout out to Mark Adams for being on top of that and Donna Adams, they really came through and got us, you know, so we could get up. But anyway, um, it just seemed like the thing to do, since we really didn't have a good place, especially to keep the babies, just to you know postpone it for a week. Now, so here we are. I will say this. Uh, some of you remember uh, five years ago, we had a very special Bible study called 52-Week Journey Through the Bible. And uh, almost immediately, things started happening and making us cancel that service. One thing, uh, I had a heart attack, and then we got back on track after that. And, it wasn't very long after that that COVID hit us and we, that completely ruined us. And so we never really got to get uncorked on that Bible study. I was so excited about it. So we're going to have to just keep, keep this one in our prayers because, you know, anything that we're doing well, you know, uh, for the Lord, uh, Satan is going to try to trip it up one way or another. And, you know, and, and that's what I thought about when I thought about what happened last week. But anyway, I'm going to continue in our study to talk about the seven letters to the churches, which is basically how this, uh, this, this book, the book of Revelation, starts. Now, if you're just joining us, very briefly, we spent last, well, two weeks ago when we opened our study, we talked about uh, the Apostle John and his vision. Now, you know, those that don't remember, John, you know, is one of the original 12. He was the disciple that Jesus loved. He was the only disciple who was at the cross when Jesus was crucified. He was the one that Jesus entrusted to take care of his mother, Mary. Uh, he was, you know, author of uh, five of the books in the Bible to include Revelation, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then, like I said, the Gospel of uh, the book of Revelation. So he's a very, very important person in the Bible, and the thing that we probably need to remember is John was the only one of the 12 that was not, did not die a martyr's death, Okay. So it's A.D. 95, he has been exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God. Uh, and so he's out there and he's on this rocky island and he has his first of a series of visions. He is uh, in the spirit on the Lord's Day. He's worshiping the Lord's Day, which we would call Sunday. Now he looks over there after he gives an introduction of who he is and, and what he represents and so on. And he looks, and there's the glorified Jesus Christ, okay? Now remember, we're not talking about the suffering servant anymore. Jesus, the suffering servant, went to the cross, and he was resurrected on the third day. He, he stayed for an extended period of time, then he ascended to heaven, and that was the end of Jesus, the suffering servant. So, so here we have the glorified Christ. He has been with the Father, okay? He has a vision, and he's, you know, glorified in all his glory. And when he goes into a, you know, a, a description of what he sees, and we won't get into that, but you know, when he sees the glorified Christ, he's obviously afraid and he falls down. And what does Jesus tell him? He says, do not be afraid. Now I want to kick in there because I think it's important. You know, they say there's 365 fear knots in the Bible. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that's a popular saying. But my point is, 
If you are a Christ follower, Jesus does not want you to be afraid. Because that is something we see time and time again. You know, you don't, God does not want us to be afraid if we belong to him. Now, there is something we talk about a lot, which is a healthy fear of God. And that's more of a reverent fear. If you're a child of God, you should have a healthy fear of God, just as you would your father who, you know, you know may discipline you when you get out of line. I know I had a healthy fear of my father, okay? That's okay. But as far as the fear that we're talking about, Jesus does not want us to be afraid. I feel like that's important as we go in this, stu this study because there's going to be a lot of scary stuff in the book of Revelation, without question. Now, as I said a couple weeks ago, I do want to remind you that if you do not belong to Jesus, if you are not a child of God, then that's a different story. Now, you know, you should be afraid. There's a lot that you need to be concerned about, without question. But the good news is, something that we're going to talk over and over again in this particular lesson is, as long as you've got a breath that you're drawing, you still have an opportunity to make it right. Now, speaking of which, at the end of chapter 1, John has got, Jesus basically gives John the outline of the book. He says, write down what you see, write down what is and what is to come. That's the outline of the book. Now, when he says what you see, he's talking about chapter 1, seeing the glorified Christ, that particular vision. When he's talking about what is, He's talking about what we're getting ready to do in chapter 2 when we talk about the condition of the seven existing churches at that time. Now, let me throw this out there. As far as what we, how we receive this, when we see, you know, Jesus talking about write down what is, we also need to be concerned with what is in our lives and in our church right now, okay? Because that is what is. Now, when you get to what is to come, He's talking about chapter 4 when he's called up to heaven, and basically, if I'm not mistaken, he says, let me show you what is to come. And that is, you know, when we start very shortly after that, kicking off the tribulation period, when God pours out his wrath on sinful humanity, those that are left behind, okay? Now, this letter, once again, to the existing churches of Asia Minor, Asia Minor being modern-day Turkey, that's where it is, you know, some scholars say that it represents uh, this, this different errors of spiritual condition throughout history. I don't subscribe to that particular one. Uh, the most likely is it represents the various spiritual conditions of the churches today. Now, let me say this. When you're talking about being convicted, one of the thing, if you're a true believer, and it's my prayer that each and every one of us have really given our hearts to God and we're children of God, then, you know, when you get into chapter 4, when you get into the tribulation part, when you get move past the you know, this letters to the churches, we shouldn't be concerned with that, at least not for ourselves, okay, because we will have been raptured. The church of Jesus Christ would have been raptured. We're in heaven when this takes place. So... As far as your, your own situation, your own heart, your own soul, if you belong to God, then that doesn't apply to you. However, it does apply to many people that you know, that you work with, people that you're related to, anyone who is not, you know, basically giving their hearts to God. You should be very much concerned with them. So I don't want to advocate a selfish approach. I'm just saying if you belong to God, you will not be in the tribulation period. Now, that brings me back to what is, okay? Basically, if you're going to be convicted, now's the time when he writes these seven letters, okay? When he's addressing these seven individual churches. Because what we're going to see as he writes these letters, we're going to see a lot of things that they are not doing right, okay? And the reason he is writing these letters at the end, he basically says, well, you have an opportunity now that I pointed it out to you, you can fix it. That's what we need to receive. Because, you know, we're also going to talk about, uh, you know, he who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's what God is saying to you, okay? If you're convicted, that's okay. The, pro the, the point is, if you're convicted, what is God telling you to do about it? And you need to do something about it while, while it is now, okay? and not what is to come. What is to come is going to be too late. Does that make sense? Okay? Don't be afraid of conviction. You know, I once heard, uh, I once heard pastor, I believe it was 
Pastor Craig, he was a pastor when I first got here, he says, look, if you're convicted, you know, somebody steps on your toes, then it's an easy solution, move your toes, you know, <laughs> move your toes, right? Well, anyway, now, another thing is, he's evaluating these churches, and he goes through seven of them, and as we go forward, he, you know, he basically, he starts with, by commending each church if they have something to commend. Now, there are two of the seven churches he can find nothing good to say about. Well, you know, he can find nothing good to say to the church at Laodicea. However, he can find something partially good to say to the church at Sardis. Basically, there are a few that have not soiled their clothes. Basically, they're living righteously. Now, he has of the five, then he goes and he, he points out things that they are not doing well. And of the seven churches, he has two that he, he can find nothing, no fault with, okay? So basically, for our purposes, two of the churches he can find nothing good to say, two of the churches he can find nothing bad to say. But the other five, there's a pattern where he, find, he says, you're doing this well and you're doing this wrong. You know, you basically need to correct this while you still got a chance. Now, one of the things that I want to speak to is you'll notice that he says the two words, I know. He starts these letters, he says, I know. I know what you're dealing with. I know about your good deeds. I know, I know, I know. That's something we need to underline. Remember, he walks amongst the lampstands as we talked about, and that cuts both ways. You know, he knows the good things you do. For example, you know, there's people that I know in this church right now that have worked like a dog for the Lord today or the last week or the last month, and none of the rest of the church knows about it. But God knows. Jesus knows. So it applies both ways. It's not just he knows if you're not serious and that sort of thing. He does, but he also knows the effort that you're putting in that someone else might not know. So it cuts both ways. I know. Jesus walking amongst the lampstands, which is the churches. So, and by the way, while I'm at it, when we talk about Jesus walking amongst the lampstands, we're not just talking about Sunday morning. Sunday morning is the illustration I used a couple weeks ago. You know, when you're in worship service, Jesus is amongst you, and he knows the condition of your heart. He knows if you're concerned with Mary Lou's shoes over there and how ugly they are, oh, I wish they wouldn't wear, well, he needs a haircut. He knows all that, okay? But he also knows if you come in that church and you're burdened and your heart is heavy and you're dealing with things. You know, he knows those things as well. Like I said, it cuts both ways. All right, now he says to angels of the churches, remember, he's talking about the pastors. There are some that believe he's talking about guardian angels, but most people believe he's talking about the pastors because angels have never been in charge of churches. Now, notice what he doesn't say. As we go forward and we study these seven, these seven churches, he doesn't say anything about attendance. He doesn't say anything about music. He doesn't say anything about fellowship events. He doesn't say anything about a lot of the things that we are concerned with. It's all about our love for him, our love for each other, and our obedience to him. That's what he's concerned with. Now, that's important to know because I, I want to point out attendance doesn't necessarily mean that a church is healthy, okay? Oftentimes, it is a byproduct that a church is healthy, but it doesn't in its own self mean that a church is healthy. Attendance is something that pleases us, okay? It doesn't necessarily please the Lord. What pleases the Lord more than that the fact that you are here is why you're here. Are you here for the right reasons? That's what he's concerned with. Now, let me ask you a couple of questions. Before we get started, why do you think the seven letters, in some people's views, including mine, are the most important part of the book for believers? I kind of told you why. <coughs> it, shows you, it shows you how it's time to do better, that it's important to, to see where you're at and try to do better. Okay. Time to do better. Anybody got else? By the way, if I'm repeating this, if you're listening at home, it's, you know, I know you can't hear the people making the comments, so we're just going to have to do the best we can, okay? Anybody got any more comments about that? Why do you think these letters are so important? Why should they speak to us in a powerful way? It also shows you what priorities you have. Okay. That's right. Priorities. Anybody else? It's showing that even though uh, churches back then, some, some churches are going to the same places as Laodicea. 
I've seen and mm. all the other ones that yeah. is happening today. It's nothing that's going to quit happening. It's going to keep on happening until people turn towards you. What does it say about how serious we should be about our faith? When you listen to these letters, how many people read read on chapter two and three before you came today? Anybody read on? Okay. Well, when you read these letters, you know it kind of hits home. So look, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ is serious business. He takes it very serious. You know, we're the bride of Christ. We are supposed to be preparing ourselves for His return. It's not something that we should take lightly. And there's no way when you see Jesus Himself now. You know, the entire Bible is the inerrant word of God. It's God breathed. Scripture is God breathed. But, you know, the reason, there's a reason why that some of the Bibles use the red letters for when Jesus is speaking. Because there's an extra emphasis in our hearts when it comes directly from Jesus. Okay? These are words that are coming directly from Jesus. And he's basically saying, in no uncertain terms, to some of these churches, he's saying, look, well, to some of them, he's saying, you're doing a great job. I love you. and You're going to be rewarded. There's some of them he's saying you're doing a good job in certain areas, and if you do this, you're going to be rewarded. But he's saying to some, particularly that last one, Laodicea, is, you know, basically you guys are lukewarm and you make me sick, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Okay, those are some serious words, okay? He is definitely paying attention, so we need to pay attention as well. Time to, you know, he's putting an exclamation point because, as I said before, he's saying this is what is. And this is what is to come. And the reason he's writing these letters is because he wants them to make the correction so they'll be ready for what is to come. Okay? That should speak to us. Now, I like to say that we need to focus on being the church that God would want to send people to. You know? And I'll, you know, basically a church that pleases him. Now, before we get started, what does that mean to you? Tell me what that means, being a church that, you know, that God would want to send people to. He's not going to send people to a church that he's not pleased with, right? Okay. What do you think that means? We're going to get into that, but this is quite a preliminary thing. Church is following God's will. Absolutely. Following God's will. Church is showing love. Church is showing love. That's the first one on the list. Yep, Absolutely. Love for Christ, love for each other, love for the community. Anybody got anything else? Church is serving, just like you said at the beginning. There you go. All right. Well, that's what we're going to talk about in this first church. So look at uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. <laughs> to the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, once again, he says to the angel, he's talking to the pastor. Jesus, each time that he introduces himself, you know, he starts writing a letter, you know, tells John to write a letter to a different church. He tells them a brief description about himself. In this case, he says that, you know, he's the one that holds the seven lampstands, you know, walks amongst the seven lampstands, holds the stars in his hands. He's trying to tell them that he's the one that's in control, okay? Now, Ephesus, for your information, was the most prominent and most, most prominent city and church of the seven. Okay? Now, Paul started this church around 40 years earlier. Now, keep in mind, if it's A.D. 95, it's someone, some 60, 65 years after Jesus was resurrected. So it's been a long time. This is the end of the century. This is the very last book of Scripture, obviously. Now, Paul started that church, and then he sent Timothy, his protege. He was a pastor there, we see in Scripture, for an extended period of time. And tradition says that John, the Apostle John himself, was the pastor at the church of Ephesus before he was exiled. So my point is, that would be like, you know, having a church here that, you know, uh, had David Jeremiah at one time, had Charles Stanley, and had Billy Graham as the pastors, Okay. Basically, they had some heavy hitters as the pastors, and some have suggested that they emphasized, you know, their pastors a little too much because of that, okay? Maybe they got a little proud. Now, in verse 2, it says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, have not grown weary. 
Now, once again, did you notice that? He says, I know. I know your deeds. I know the good things that you've done. Okay? He always starts. If he has anything good to say, that's the way he leads in. I know your deeds. I know your hard work. I know your perseverance. Now, effectively, in many ways, this was a very strong church. Okay? First of all, this was a serving church. They were getting the message out. They were doing what they were called to do. They were doing what was needed to keep the church up. It says they were laboring effectively to the point of exhaustion. So this was a hardworking church. This was a church that, you know, had people in there, a majority of people that wanted to serve, that wanted to get involved, that were active, that they, they were doers, okay? And all that was good, and all that was pleasing to the Lord, okay? Now, this was a sacrificing church. They persevered. Now, keep in mind, most every church, the early church, was persecuted, either by the Jews or the Romans, you know, sometimes both, which was the case with the second church that we're going to talk about. Now, so they dealt with death being a real possibility. When we say persecuted, they weren't called a bunch of names and that was it or, or ostracized, you know, like we might be today. And that, you know, they actually, you know, many of them died for the faith, okay? That was the way they lived. Now, basically, today, we don't have, you know, at this particular time, here in America anyway, we don't have to, you know, deal with persecution at that level. And we don't have to sacrifice at that level. They were sacrificing tremendously. We'll get into that in a minute. You know, as we talk, you know, we kind of narrow it down to you, you're asked to sacrifice your time, talent, and treasure. You know, your time, you know, for example, I thought about how that works. And many of you guys work jobs, and then many of you guys work jobs and you have kids, and it's hard for you to get here, okay? So it's a real sacrifice for you to get here, you know, and, and study the Word of God and serve the church. So... That's a common thing, you know. We have energy. Hilton just told me that he worked all day in the yard ministry. His back's killing him, you know. Um, that takes energy, you know. Uh, you know, the building and grounds, when the mulch that was put out there, Mark can't walk either because his back. You know, I mean, you know, there is energy involved. Nobody, I mean, we enjoy the fellowship, but, you know, let's face it, nobody, like, really enjoys shoveling mulch all day, right? You know, okay. So chasing those kids as much as we love them. Okay, now that's a chore, right? Let's not beat around the bush. But anyway, it has to be done. Then you have the treasure, you know, the expenses of the church, the benevolent issues that come periodically, the extra money and that sort of thing. But then notice he says they were not tolerating the false teachers. In other words, they held to the truth of Scripture. They never compromised the truth. They never lost their sensitivity towards sin. Now... One of the things on a personal note, thinking about, you know, they had spiritual discernment, and they could tell when a teacher was, you know, leading them down the wrong road, if their doctrine was incorrect or their motives were incorrect. They could tell that, and they didn't tolerate it. And I thought about, you know, the last uh, 17 years, uh, just about the entire time that I've been a, pa a pastor, I've had a pastor or two, in this case two, would combine 100 years' experience in the congregation. And that's a good thing because they're not going to let me preach anything that's inaccurate, okay? Hopefully they'll pull me off the side and won't call me out in front of everybody. <laughs> but they will, you know, they're not going to tolerate the Word of God being misrepresented. So it's always a good thing when you've got people who know the Word of God. Now, hypothetically, what would be a bad thing is if the entire congregation did not know the Word. You know, I could tell you anything. You see what I'm saying? That would get me in trouble, but it also leads you down the wrong road. So it's very important that we hold each other accountable. Now, I do make mistakes. I do misspeak sometimes. I listen to some sermons that I've done, and I said the wrong word. Don't even know why I said it, okay? But for the most part, I certainly try to hold to the truth of the words of God. I'm committed to it. I preach the Bible, okay? Now, you know, these days... In too many cases, and I, I don't want to take one just giant swath and say everybody, but especially, you know, in on television, you know, preaching seems to be show business. And, you know, and, and that's, that's giving Jesus a black eye, black eye, especially when you get into the health and wealth, you know, gospel that's being, you know, promoted out there and that sort of thing. But anyway, one of the things that is happening a lot that we talk about a lot is the gospel's been being watered down. Okay, it's being watered down so it's more p 
palatable, what, how do you say that word? Palatable. Palatable. Oh, palatable. You know, easier to swallow for people who, who, who can't swallow, right? And you know, that's a dangerous thing. Now, basically, at the end of the day, Jesus is pleased with the church to teach us the word with authority. Jesus is pleased with the, with the, with the, with the church that's committed to the truth, okay? Um, and also, you know, one of the things that I found very helpful to keep me out of trouble is I tend to preach through books of the Bible. I do preach occasionally topical sermons, but, you know, for the most part, I'm preaching through the Bible, and what that does is, you know, it allows me not to skip over anything. If it's a convicting message, I'm going to preach it. Preach it like I mean it. If it's a uplifting message, which I enjoy more, obviously, I'm going to preach it like I mean it. You know, but it's laid out for, before me, you know. If you'll know, it, it, now, if I go over there and I preach it through the Bible and I skip over the hard parts, then you know you got a problem, right? Well, anyway, bottom line is Jesus is pleased with this church in the area of serving. He's pleased with the sacrifice that they're willing to make and the commitment to the truth as well as the commitment to that church. Now, let me ask you this question. What do you think our church does or does not have in common so far with this church? You think we're a serving church? You want to elaborate? There's a lot of, like you said before, people in the background. There's a lot of people that pull together and do stuff, but there's a lot of people in the background that serve, and you never know they serve. You, you almost take it for granted because they're doing their stuff, but they're not getting any credit for it because they're not seeking credit for it. They're doing it because uh, they want to serve. Right. Um, and they're they're behind the scenes doing things we don't necessarily give them a lot of praise for. All right. I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Anybody else elaborate on that? I think the Word of God is taught and it's preached. Okay. Consistently. Well, Kenny would get me if I didn't. <laughs> All right. And I'd want him to. All right. Well, you know, let me, let me speak to the serving church. I want to be honest. You know, I don't want to pat us on the back if we don't deserve to be patted on the back because ultimately it's God who should, is the one we need to please. But best I can tell, you know, from my experience, this is one of the most serving churches. It's definitely at this particular stage, it's, you know, uh, if you talk about people and the percentage of people that are plugged in and serving, this is at the highest level of any church that I've ever been a part of. Now, that I can say safely. And I feel like, you know, we could stand up against any church our size in, in the county or, or the country. And what I mean is we got a group of serving people to really jump in and do what's needed to be done. And people come right into gates and they start serving. And, you know, and, and I, I, so I'm very pleased as far as pastor at the level of service that we have here at this church. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus is too. So yes, I would say we're a serving church, sacrifice church. You know, you know, there's a lot of people to give up a lot of things, so I think we're that too. And we're a committed church, you know, obviously. So we have a lot in common with the church at Ephesus at this particular point. But here I'm going to throw a monkey wrench in you. Verse 4, it says, Yet I hold this against you, you have forsaken your first love. Now, basically, they had forgotten the main ingredient. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 13.1. It says, If I speak in tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Basically, love is the most important thing, okay? And they were missing that, particularly their love for Jesus Christ. Now, that's what they're talking about, first of all. That's what Jesus says, say, your first love was me. <clears throat> now, in our group of, you know, our church, the Lord has blessed us with a lot of uh, uh, new believers and a lot of people who are plugging in and sort, and, you know, and there's a certain fire that most people, when they first start seeking the Lord, have, and you can, it's obvious, and it's exciting, it's contagious, but after you've been serving a while and you've been into to the day-to-day -day church activities, I'm talking about 10, 15 years, 20, 30, 40 you know, sometimes if you're not disciplined and you're not careful, you can get busy 
And you can forget why you come out to church. You can forget the main reason you're coming out, the main reason you're doing the things you're doing. All you know is, you know, you got to, I got to keep kids today. I'll, I'm supposed to have choir practice at so-and-so. And you get all busy, and Jesus might not even appear on your radar the whole time, okay? It appears that this church had allowed that to take hold and, and, and has gone too far, okay? Because Jesus said, you, you've forgotten your first love. You've forgotten me. Now, it also appears to have been a cold church. And also, some have said it was a proud church, that it was a large and proud church, okay? Now, we've all heard stories of cold churches. Um, and we'll continue to hear stories of cold churches. I, I don't know. Lee Hilton told me about someone visited a few weeks ago, and they volunteered that they had been to a church. I think we, I don't know if we said this. And uh, nobody spoke to them except one person. And you know what they said? You're in my seat. <laughs> you know? All right, that's a cold church, right? That's a church that's got a problem. I wouldn't want that guy representing my church if he's the only one that spoke. But anyway, that sort of stuff happens. Okay? And that's really, really terrible. Basically, they're talking about serving with no passion. Now, if you were to use them, uh, an analogy of marriage, it'd be kind of like, you know, I'll pick on John. I love to pick on John and Misty. And it'd be like John and Misty, you know, are still married, and John still takes out the trash. He still pays the bills. He still picks up the kids. He still does all these things. You know, he just don't love Misty anymore, right? <laughs> well, that's kind of what we're talking about here. You know, you can spot people who have tuned Jesus out, but they're still coming to church. You can spot people who are just coming, you know, punching ticket. I'm supposed to be there. And matter of fact, there are many that have done that all their lives. And, you know, and, and, you know it, it shows in, in the fruit that they're producing. But anyway... There are some, and you've seen this, and I've seen a lot of this. I do not see this here, but I've seen this in the past. That they, they Not only do they lose their love for Jesus, they develop a love for power. Or they develop a love for attention. Okay, Church is a vehicle for power and being in control, or church is a vehicle for getting a lot of attention. Okay, I think you get the point. Now, basically, if they lost their passion and their love for Jesus, which we're sure about, one can infer that they had lost a considerable amount of love for one another and the community, okay? Now, we don't know that, but that's, you know, that's an educated guess. Now, here's where I'm going with that. You know, and from my observations, what I see out in our country as far as the Christian faith and the churches is you have some churches that have emphasized God's love at the expense of His holiness, okay? If you see what I'm saying, in other words, those are watered down. And then you have had some churches that have overemphasized God's holiness at the expense of his love. Those are the mean-spirited Christians. Those are the mean-spirited folks that have judgmental attitudes, that haven't understood the concept of, of love to sin or hate to sin. Okay? They don't get that. They just hate everybody. They might know the Bible inside and out, but, you know, you never tell it. They don't know how to live it. Now, what's the point, right? Now, the Bible says truth in love. What does that mean, you know, the truth in love? What does that scripture mean? It means don't compromise, hold to the truth of God's word, but do it in a loving way. Okay, that's what it means. That's in a nutshell, the truth in love. Don't compromise on what you believe. Hold true to the, to the, the teaching of God's word but always do it in a loving way. You know, you don't have to hit people in the mouth to, you know, to be uncompromising. Does that make any sense? Okay. All right. Now, here's another thing before we go forward. I feel like in the society that we live in, and I, I do not want to go political. I'm just saying that, you know, it seems to me that the message of love has been stolen from us as believers. You know, in other words, we have been painted, and sometimes we have deserved it, as hardline and, and judgmental and mean-spirited and all those things. So the message of love has been stolen from us to some degree. And, you know, those people who are those things, they basically take all the focus away from the people like here at Grace that, that are not those things, that know how to love, know how to express that love. 
we got to get love back into the conversation as believers. Would you all agree with that statement? Yes. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. How has the church lost its first love? Yeah, we've done that. Water down the word. How else? They become more worldly than they are church. All right. They listen to what the world, they want to be a church that brings in the crowds, the flashy churches. All right. The church that changes their um, scriptures in the Bible to meet the needs of people that are going to that church. Yeah. Okay. Now, as it pertains, we're going to get into a lot of that, but as it pertains to this church having lost its love, you know, this church, you know, like I said, was a cold church. Uh, it was doing a lot of things right. It was uncompromising, so that was not the problem with the church at Ephesus. But, you know, like I said, you can infer that they lost their love for one another in the community. Let me ask a question. How should we see unbelievers? Amen. Every person that you meet is someone Jesus cared enough to die for. That's right. And then I'm going to ask the follow-up question. How can we reach people if we, if we find ourselves hating them? Is society teaching us to hate people? Yes. Okay. Are we falling for it as believers more than we like to admit? Yes, we are. You know, we should view them as compassionate. Okay. That's what we need to do. Yeah. There's a culture war going out there, but we can't go to so far that we just hate everybody. You know, we're not, you're not, not going to reach people, you know, that you hate. And they're going to feel the hate. They're never going to feel your love and compassion. The truth in love. Not to compromise, but do it in a loving way. Okay? Isn't it really? Because I was, like, listening to something on the, on the way here. This is the way you said that. And it was, like, really infuriating. It's gossip. This was on a Christian radio station. I'll just tell you real briefly. Well, you, you need the Lord. My first thing is, I'm mad at these people. Yeah. I'm angry. This yeah. is terrible. This is disgusting. And, and it is all those things, but, you know, it's a discipline. You, you got to re you remember, you can't let your hate of the system and the world, which is legitimate, you should hate the world system, allow it to cross over where you just hate everybody. You know, and some people have letting that get away from them, and they're believers, okay? And, and they're actually being taught to do that. And that's, you know, Jesus doesn't teach us to do that. You see what I'm saying? But right here in his word, he says he detested. Yeah, well, you, we'll get in that. I, I see what you're saying. And what I'm saying is, though, you know. Are we not to be like Jesus? I mean, that's kind of my point. He detests these things, but he doesn't test his people. Yeah, I get you. That's my point. It's a discipline to love the sinner, hate the sin. Right. It's a discipline that you've got to work at. Because if you're not careful, you'll be hating everybody. Okay? At the same time, the lukewarm people, he says he spews them out of his mouth, and he's talking about people. Well, we're going to get to that. <laughs> that's, that's the seventh church. Yeah, All right, let's look at verse 5. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, like I said, he's concerned with the motives, the condition of our heart. He's basically saying rekindle the fire, okay? 
Do what you did at first. Remember when you first started getting serious about your faith, when you first accepted Christ. You know, try to get back to that place with his help is what he's saying. Now, it should be noted that the church of Ephesus never did get it right, and now the church does not exist. It became a heap of rubble. Now, basically, he's saying make the corrections you need to make while you still can. They did not heed his advice. And then he says, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, the Nicolaitans, you know, uh, which we'll see again in the church of Pergamum, this was, you know, there's, first of all, no one really knows what they practice, what they believe, okay? Now, there's two views. One is, you know, Nicolaitan followers of Nicholas, which meant, you know, there were people who had conquered. Uh, basically, they, they considered themselves above others, like the Pharisees, and who Jesus despised. And, you know, and then the other one is that they were a group that uh, promoted conformity, okay? It doesn't really matter if it was self-righteous or if it was watering down the faith. Jesus hates both, okay? And he commended them for, you know, not allowing that teaching or that attitude to take hold. Now, like I said, we don't really know who they were. Now, in verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Basically, he's saying what we need to be doing right in here. Put your spiritual ears on. What's God saying to you? Okay? Hear it. Absorb it. You know? And, you know, uh, respond to it. Okay? And that's a great way to see this. Now, the tree of life, obviously, is uh, paradise of God uh, as heaven. New Jerusalem, Revelation 22, verse 1 says, Then the angel showed me the river and the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Okay, that's at the end. Now, I'm running out of time. And I want to keep Bessie from hating on me. I, uh, anybody got any thoughts? I, I thought I might could get into the church at Smyrna, but I don't have time for that tonight. So I will say, Google, what, what Google says about the Nicolaitans. Okay. Is that they believe that it was okay to have one foot in both worlds. Mm -hmm. And that Christians didn't need to be so strict about separating. Yeah, conformity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody got anything? Speak for your servant is listening. All right, pull your prayer list out.